Ed Jones, who will talk about Rust from start to snap. Thanks. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Ed. I'm a software engineer with Canonical, and I work in the office of the CTO, uh, working on lots of cool stuff. I've, I've learned uh, Rust about a year ago, and uh, since then, it's kind of changed my life, so I, I want to kind of share a little bit of the good vibes with, with you guys. So uh, coming up, I'm going to uh, go just over a little of the background of uh, well, why it's worth thinking about this stuff, uh, why you then want to use Rust, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, distributing Rust in the context of a snap package. So uh, first up, background. Um, I work a lot on code in my free time. Uh, my main project that I work on is uh, a little typesetter. Uh, I've been working on it for about two or three years. And for the first two years of those, develop those years of development, uh, it was done in C. The reason why it was done in C was because I did not know C, and the way I learn new languages, which I like doing, is by just throwing myself into a really large project and just seeing what happens. Um, so that was all, gr all great. Two years later, the project kind of slowed down a little bit, and I was getting a lot of problems, which uh, kind of was centering around smart pointers and, and uh, memory allocation, and the tooling wasn't great. And uh, I ended up switching to Rust, and quite frankly, I'm very glad that I did. So uh, begs the question, what exactly is Rust? So, the story of Rust starts uh, in a stairwell somewhere between the first and the 21st floor of a, an apartment building in Vancouver. Uh, the creator of, of Rust, Graydon Hoare, has come home from a holiday and he finds that, yet again, the elevator is broken. Oh, to be specific, the elevator is not broken, only the software which runs the elevator is broken. And he thinks to himself as he is walking up 20 flights of stairs, isn't it ridiculous that after 30 years of pro professional software development, humanity has yet to find a way of making something as simple as a lift controller, which doesn't crash when left on its own. So the problem here is likely that uh, these lift controllers are written in languages like C or C++, and when you're using those languages, it's very, very easy to run into memory errors. So he thinks to himself, what if I make another language which can try to solve these problems? And the result of this language is Rust, named after a fungus which is ridiculously over-optimized for survival. So. Uh, this is what we have. Rust's uh, been around since what, like 2006, I can't remember the date exactly. Um, and for the first couple years of its life, it was under the ownership of Mozilla, which was the company where Graydon Hall worked. And Mozilla was sponsoring it and, and working on it as part of their servo browser uh, initiative. But unfortunately, due to the pandemic, uh, they kind of ran out of money with that, kind of had to cut back on, on some of their teams. They disbanded the servo team and kind of left Rust uh, to the community. So now, instead of being run by Mozilla, it is run by these guys, the Rust Foundation, who work uh, in tandem with the uh, Rust core team to promote, uh, to, to, these guys are responsible for promoting Rust and the Rust core team are responsible for developing Rust. So what is it about Rust that piqued these guys' interest? So at its core, Rust is a, low, uh, is a language which allows you to have the performance of a low-level language. C is notoriously fast because there are so few levels of abstraction between you and the bare metal. But what comes with this is a lot of difficulty because then you're responsible for managing all the memory yourself and things can get really hairy if you're, uh, if you're in a very complicated system. And writing low-level code at scale is not a very pleasant experience. So the other part of Rust, which I really like, is the ability that you can write high-level abstractions while still getting the low-level performance. I'll get to how this happens in, in a moment. Uh, but generally speaking, I think the high-level abstractions and the low-level performance is, a, is an attractor in itself to why you'd want to learn uh, Rust just as a language. But I don't think that's the main reason why people learn it. I'll get onto that in a moment. So Rust is also statically typed. It's uh, static typing is a thing which I have come to really appreciate uh, when just a few short years ago, I was in uni, uh, I was doing a machine learning course and uh, me being me and there's like loads and loads of coursework happening, I had left this kind of to the last minute. This coursework required uh, me to write a Python script uh, which did run some machine learning models uh, and the training for that lasted for about 45 minutes. Now, I am sat in a lecture theater listening to a different lecture with my laptop just to the side of me, 
while running these models. These models take 45 minutes to run. So I'm, I'm sat there glancing over at my laptop, taking notes, everything seems to be going fine. But when it gets to the very end, the thing just crashes before saving all of the data. Now, with very little time left, I have no data with, uh, to paste into my report, and hence I can't finish my work. The problem was essentially a type error in the code which was uh, uh, used to save the results, which was infuriating because I had done all of the work, and then now because of this stupid mistake, I had to run the code again, and another 45 minutes, giving me basically 15 minutes to finish off my report and submit it, and the deadline was very hard on that day. Uh, so that wasn't fun at all. What would have fixed this is had I had access to static typing, which Rust very much does. So even though there are more headaches associated with it, it is well worth the payoff. Finally, uh, Rust is memory safe. So this is one of the key visions that Graydon Hoare uh, had. It adds a, a notion of, of lifetimes, which allows you to have low level memory uh, patterns and, and low um, memory usage, just like in C, but it doesn't then require you to write all of the frees yourself. The Rust type system has enough uh, information at its disposal to figure out all of the, the, uh, the mechanics of when to create and free memory. You just have to give it a few hints here and there. Those few hints are quite difficult to, to learn. I, I would be very much lying if I told you it was easy. Which kind of leads to Rust having two impressions from people from, from the outside. Firstly, uh, Rust is very difficult to learn, it would seem. Like, there are so many really complicated to uh, concepts in Rust that it might be a little bit off-putting. But then you pair this with the fact that Rust has consistently been very, very popular, and you kind of wonder, what's happening? I'll just quantify very popular. So for the past seven years in a row, Rust has been by quite some margin uh, the most popular language according to the Stack Overflow Developers Survey. So what's, what's going on there? How can such a difficult language be so popular? And I think this isn't solely down to the safety aspects of Rust, which are usually very much touted, because there are languages which provide very good safety, but the user experience is very much lacking. So instead, let's look at all the stuff around Rust. Why should you use it? So here I'm gonna go through like four reasons which I, I personally think are very important. I think everyone has probably their own reasons and their own weightings for what would, what would matter to them most, but oh, here's mine. So firstly, zero cost abstractions. This is a buzzword that you're gonna hear around the Rust community like a lot. And when I saw this, I was skeptical, because this just sounds like nonsense. How can something really be for free? And the answer is that it's for free at runtime, and that's thanks to these guys. Because Rust compiles to LLVM, you get the full power of, of 20 years worth of, uh, worth of insanely good compiler research made by these guys, which that is what then allows you to write human-friendly code, which then, because it's run through LLVM and through their optimizations, can get compiled into something which the machine will then like. Say you have a bunch of function calls, LLVM may just choose to unwrap all those and remove all of those extra operations so that actually what you're running at, at runtime looks far, far simpler, but to develop it would be quite unpleasant. So the, uh, the next thing I think uh, is the secret to Rust's success is documentation. Quite frankly, the Rust documentation is some of the best I have ever seen in any project. When you look at the, at the documentation for any crate package, the first thing you'll see is a description of, of, of the, that package and then examples for how you can use that. So you can immediately just see, oh, that's what's going on. I can just paste that into I don't know, my own terminal or maybe click the run button which will be present there uh, on, on, in some cases, and just, just play with it, essentially. And here's the, the, the key trick, which is that this isn't just text. These examples are actually unit tests, which means that when the documentation is compiled, these are actually checked, so they don't go out of date. It's not like you look at a, an answer on Stack Overflow from like five years ago and you have to think to yourself, hold on a sec, has the API changed? Has the, has the semantics changed? Does this still work? 
No, with, with these things, it does still work. You have the guarantee. Now, if these function level documentation pieces aren't uh, enough, oh, I should also mention, uh, these examples are also present on basically every public API function too. But if that function level documentation isn't enough, it's very, very common for packages to have their own book. So here, they will add uh, lots of information on extra topics surrounding uh, the crate, so you will be able to more easily use it. The, in this example, this is uh, for a crate called uh, Lalapop, which uh, is a parser generator. And they give you a crash course on parsers because you kind of need to know that to use the crate. I think it's pretty cool. Next thing I, I, I think uh, why Rust is so, uh, so successful is its tooling. Quite frankly, its tooling is out of this world. Let's start with the compiler. This is a Rust program. It doesn't look too bad, but there is actually a, a small problem here. If I run it through the compiler, the compiler will then tell me exactly where that problem is, what has caused that problem with these nice helpful annotations, and what's more is that basically every error message in Rust will have an error code associated with it. If you can see at the bottom, I don't know how easy it is to see, it, it points to you being able to run the, uh, Rust C dash dash explain that error code. If you do that, you will get something like this, which is a nice long form explanation for what went wrong. And that's right in your terminal. So you don't have to go out to Google and know, sift through like ten or uh, five or ten uh, articles which are full of just complete nonsense before maybe finding the answer. No, it's, it's, it's right there. The next tool I think is really cool is the, is the linter. So this is uh, quite a simple program. It takes, uh, it, it's just taking the first element of, of a list. Well, how I've made the, uh, that, uh, the functionality to get the first element is by creating an iterator and then calling next on it. But that's kind of a bit of a verbose way of doing that. Maybe it's a result of refactoring. But if I were to run the, the linter on this, it says, oh, actually, you can call dot first to get the first element of the list. And it's made that, that nice suggestion. Quite a cool thing uh, about this linter is that you can then uh, pass dash dash fix on it. So uh, if you have these problems, the, the linter can go ahead and just fix them for you. And there you go at the bottom, that's, that's the code just fixed, which will significantly reduce the annoying time spent on all these tiny little problems, and the result is much e it's much easier to have very nice code. Lastly on tooling, I wanted to talk about testing. There is only, like, there's like one official way of writing tests in Rust. So it, here's a function, it takes, uh, it, it just computes the, uh, it takes a string and if present, it returns the first vowel in that string, so A, I, O, or U. So to test this, all I have to do is, in the same file, I can add a little bit of this. Uh, ignore the con uh, CFG test stuff, that's just like a flag to make sure that this stuff doesn't get compiled when uh, you're building for like releases or in incremental mode. Only when you're building tests does this stuff appear in the binary. But to make these individual functions tests, all you have to do is add the test annotation on it. And there you go, tests. And because of Rust's really nice high level um, abstractions, you can write these tests in a far more ergonomic way than say if you're doing the same thing in C. This, this is something I, I really appreciate, but I, I realize that other languages kind of uh, already, already got there first. Finally, I think the last uh, secret weapon for Rust success is its community. So really, when you're learning Rust, no one will come to it knowing everything that there is to know. There is so much very complicated stuff in the language that everyone has been there at some point where they do not know something, looking at something, I don't quite understand it. So everyone understands this is where everyone has been. So you can just ask for help. Like, there are p the people in the Rust community are quite frankly the most welcoming group of individuals I have ever seen. <laughs> like, and they're kind of everywhere. There's, there's a, a Discord group, there's discourse as well. You can talk to the, uh, the Rust core team if you want to on the Zulip instance. And uh, there's also where I hang out most, there's the uh, Rust Reddit, where of course you can see plenty of stuff, you know. <laughs> so, that's the thing, if you need help, you can just ask. It's not like with other forums where you'll be told, read the manual and they're given no further information. People are really willing to help here. So where do I start learning Rust after all this? I think if you wanted to start, uh, there are plenty of good places, 
but the one which I would recommend above all to at least try is the Rust book. This is uh, like the one definitive text uh, showing you Rust from start to finish from the perspective of a beginner. It has lots of examples in it and, and like projects you can work through and tons of explanations, not only on uh, why uh, the code that you're creating works, but also why it is that way. So in reading this, you'll actually get a really good understanding for why Rust has these complicated parts in it and uh, what, it, what problems these are trying to solve. If you wanted to move on to something more practical, there's also uh, rustlings as well, just like short little exercises which help, help you get you really used to using the tooling around Rust. Uh, if you wanted something a bit harder, there's exorcism.org has a, uh, a, a course on Rust. And uh, last but not least, uh, there's a, a book which I really like called Rust for Rustations. Now, a book of this nature is really difficult to get in other languages I have found. So, what this book gives you is not only how to program in Rust, they kind of assume that you've read uh, or like are roughly competent. You don't, have to, you, have, you don't have to be a genius at Rust, you have to just be aware of it. It shows you how to write idiomatic Rust, and it also shows you how to de design good Rust APIs, which I think is something that's, that I, having been through uni and learned like a whole, a whole bunch of different languages, I never fa felt like I was taught how do I make an API that people want to use and that is nice and clean. This book, Rust for Rustations, has a lot of tips in it. In my day job, I don't work in Rust yet, I'm still working on that, uh, I work in Go, and I have found that actually a lot of the tips which are present in this book help in Go. They're not just specific to Rust, a lot of it is just good practice, so I'd, I'd highly recommend a read. Um, all of these are available for free online, but if, like me, uh, you're a little bit old and, I, and, and like uh, having a paper book in front of you, uh, there is a nice thick copy of the, uh, the Rust book that you can get, and Rust for Rust Stations is also available uh, in paperback form as, as well, just on, on Amazon. So, uh, let's, let's assume, oh, I'll, I'll go back you. Let's assume that um, you kind of know Rust now. Um, you've, you've made some stuff. Uh, I'm not going to teach you Rust because that's quite frankly a very personal experience and I think everyone has to go through it their own way. But let's say uh, you have written a Rust application and now you want to show it to the world. So you want to distribute Rust, possibly in a snap. I'm going to uh, hopefully show you why actually a snap is a really, really good way of doing this. So first up, uh, the first method, if you're not thinking about snaps, that you would think to distribute your code is through crates.io. This is the central Rust uh, packaging repository, essentially. So this is great. Uh, it's, it's kind of, the experience of using this is the same across all platforms, uh, and it's really nice. But uh, this requires Cargo to already be installed, because actually behind the scenes, this will be compiling your Rust application on your user's machine. Now, Rust compilation is notoriously quite slow, so maybe it'll be nicer for your user to get a binary instead so they don't have to wait 10 minutes while your code compiles. Uh, also, Cargo doesn't have any kind of sandboxing. Uh, you're, just, you're just kind of downloading binary packages and, uh, onto your system and hoping that they don't do anything nasty, which isn't, isn't necessarily the case. Uh, so, you could perhaps go down the route of distro-specific packaging if you wanted binaries. In this case, uh, the support is absolutely excellent. Every Linux distro has its package manager. It's one of the great strengths of Linux. Uh, the binaries can, can be included. You don't have to wait for, uh, like, your user doesn't have to wait for, for Rust. However, there are lots of Linux distributions, hence there are lots of formats that you need to know. And if you are like me and working in a fairly small team, in my case a team of one, learning a lot of package formats is a really big overhead. So that's kind of a bit annoying. And if I don't support all of them, my users will get annoyed that, hey, why didn't you support my distro? And the answer is, I'm trying to, I just haven't got there yet. So that's not great. Also. No sandboxing, you're just uh, running someone else's code. In this case, it's just a, it's possibly just a binary, so, you know, a bit iffy there. So, I think the right solution for uh, packaging Rust binaries uh, is neither of these, but actually snaps, as, uh, as you might have guessed. So, why would I want to use a snap? Firstly, the experience is the same across all platforms. Uh, 
meaning that you can actually get a snap on any Linux distribution and also on Mac OS and on Windows if you so choose. So immediately, the distribution uh, possibilities have just opened up. Also, uh, the, the compilation of, of snaps can be done centrally in, on this Snapcraft server farm, meaning that you can quite easily get cross-architecture uh, support. So you don't have to do cross-compilation if you want to support, say, ARM, HF, uh, I don't know, S390X, all, all lots of really uh, wacky architectures that maybe you don't have a device in front of you which uh, you're going to be compiling those on. We'll just handle those for you, basically for free, which is kind of nice. Uh, the snaps can, of course, include binaries because they're compiled on our server farm and uh, hence meaning that your user can run on any platform basically instantly, which is kind of nice. And finally, and most importantly, confinement. Snaps are confined, just like, say, on, on mobile OSs where you have, uh, uh, on mobile OSs where your user must give you permission to uh, use certain capabilities, in snaps, the same is kind of true, because uh, you're, if you need access, say, to the window uh, manager, then you have to request access and your user has, <laughs> has to grant you that access. If they don't give you that access, you can't access it. So that kind of reduces the possibilities for you doing nasty stuff on other people's systems. Hence, your users are pretty happy, I think. So yeah, that's why I think uh, snaps are, are pretty great. So just to close out, um, oh, actually, uh, how, how would I actually go about snapping Rust? So this is a, a manifest for a snap for Rust. Firstly, uh, I'll just quickly go through it. A lot of this will be generated by just running Snapcraft in it, uh, and you'll just get a, a, a template for all this, and you can fill in most of the, the fields. It's, it's relatively self-explanatory. The summary is a summary of the package, you know, that sort of stuff. Where it starts to get interesting uh, is uh, you can specify the confinement uh, of the Snap. Here we specify that it, is, it uses strict confinement, hence uh, all the, the nice properties of not being able to do unwanted stuff that I mentioned uh, before will apply. Now, how do you actually compile Rust? Well, Rust support is basically first class in snaps. All you have to do is, at the bottom where you're specifying parts, which are um, the things which are gonna be compiled in, into your snap, uh, you just specify, that you, I just wanna use the Rust plugin. That, that's it. And now, all of your Rust code will be automatically compiled by the tooling inside of Snapcraft. That's kinda neat. And then you can upload it, and then your users can install it with like sudo snap install my, uh, my app name here. Yeah. So I think that's kind of cool. Uh, so yeah, just, just to end, uh, we are a reviving local uh, Ubuntu and open source community groups. If you want to get involved, here is a QR code. Um, if you want to come talk like open source, uh, Ubuntu, maybe Rust, uh, then here you go. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my talk. Any, any questions? Uh, it's a clarification rather than a question. Um, snaps themselves don't run on Windows and Mac. Snapcraft, the utility to build snaps, does. Thank you. <laughs> I should mention this is our, our foremost Snap expert, so that they all know. <laughs> any any other questions? What do you prefer, Go or Rust? <laughs> the question is, uh, okay, uh, the question is, what do I prefer, Go or Rust, and why? Uh, well. <laughs> If it, if it were just up to me, I would prefer to use Rust. But I have to admit, there are some quite nice properties of, of Go. Um, so I like that Rust is completely memory safe and it forces you to be, be that. But I also like about Go that there's kind of only one Go idiomatic way of doing something. And that way is usually uh, the simplest looking. And the result of this is firstly, when you're having pull requests and arguments with whoever's reviewing it, there are fewer arguments to be had, which is kind of nice. Uh, and the second thing is that the APIs end up a lot simpler, which I gotta admit, Rust APIs are not the simplest in existence. Um, I think Go kind of wins on that one. But for me, 
type system memory safety is my, uh, my thing, so I, would, I usually prefer to use Rust in my own time. Uh, so the question is about uh, how, how much faster is the performance of Rust uh, versus other stuff. So uh, Rust is very performant. I don't have numbers off the top of my head, but I remember seeing a paper, um, there was a study a, a while ago, which uh, looked at various different benchmarks of, of uh, like lots of languages. And if the speed of C is rated at uh, like one, then uh, the speed of Rust in these benchmarks is about 1.05. There's an extra overhead of adding in safety checks, um, which Rust has. But that extra 5% slowdown, I think is kind of worth it, um, given that the other, the field of the rest of uh, the languages being looked at were like, uh, I don't know, like 80 or, or 90 times slower in the case of uh, was it Python or Lua. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. So it's, it's, yeah, it's probably Python. <laughs> so blazingly fast within 5% of C, I think is pretty good. <laughs> Uh, the question is on, is compilation uh, time slow? Uh, well, it depends what you're doing. If you're compiling for release uh, with the, by default, Cargo will compile with um, the, the highest level of optimization, like uh, passing dash 03 to GCC. Uh, in that case, it is quite slow and can last uh, for a large project on the order of minutes. However, the Rust type system is very, very effective. And if you want to skip code generation, which is the, va the vast majority of uh, that time, you can run cargo check and it will just type check everything. So admittedly, you won't be running any code, but as a trade-off, you're going a lot faster and it takes like I don't know, milliseconds maybe. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Uh, okay, the question is on the penalty of running programs through Snap. Um, well. <laughs> I mean, if you're saving a sandbox stuff, for example. Uh, I want to say that the, the, the system calls, will, there'll be an extra overhead checking that everything is all right, but uh, I, I am not the one who knows the most about this. Uh, I'll just hand over. <laughs> So a lot of work has been done on performance of snaps. Um, in terms of the Firefox snap, that is now as performant as natively installed. Just a zoom example. Um, other snaps may not be as optimized, but there are things you can do to improve the uh, performance of a snap package that you create. I, I think, um Perhaps in the past there was a reputation for snaps being a little bit slower, but uh, that may not be the case anymore. So Igor Lubinčić um, did a presentation a few weeks ago at the Linux App Summit on the performance of snaps. Uh, so go and find that on YouTube. It's well worth a watch, uh, and it, you may get some tips. The question is on uh, the Rust support in, in the Linux kernel and what do I think about it. I think that it is a fantastic idea. If it were up to me, more and more of the Linux kernel over time would be rewritten in Rust because the extra safety that you would get uh, across such a large code base written in C and, 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 and um, I think it's mostly C actually, uh, would just be, it would just be great. There, there are. There are lots and lots of bugs inside of large pieces of software. The Linux kernel is not immune from these. So rewriting significant parts of that in a language which gets rid of many of these low-level exploits, I think can only be a good thing. I mean, if 
there's, if there's no more questions, should, should we uh, call it a day? Everyone has a couple minutes extra.